This audio presentation was pre recorded and edited for brevity and clarity. Hello, my name is Diana Campbell, and I'm pleased to be here with you for today's macular degeneration chat Treatment Options for Geographic Atrophy. This chat is brought to you today by Bright Focus Foundation. Macula macular degeneration research is one of our programs here at Bright Focus. We fund exceptional scientific research worldwide to defeat Alzheimer's disease, macular degeneration, and glaucoma and we provide expert information on these heartbreaking diseases. You can find much more information on our website, www.brightfocus.org. Just a few housekeeping items before we start. If you'd like to ask a question during today's call, simply press star three. An operator will take down your question and put you right back into the discussion. Any questions that we don't get to today will be saved for future chats. If you get disconnected for some reason, you can call back at 877-229-8493 and enter the code 112435. Again, that's 877-229-8493 with the code 112435. A live stream of the chat is also available today at brightfocus.org slash live chat. After today's chat, a written transcript will be available in about two weeks, so don't feel like you need to take notes. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's guest, Dr. Viral Sheff, who will discuss geographic atrophy, an advanced and severe form of dry age-related macular degeneration, and the landscape of treatments that are currently available. Dr. Sheff is a native Chicagoan that specializes in diseases of the retina and vitreous. He is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as a partner at University Retina and Macula Associates. He is director of clinical trials at one of the busiest clinical trial sites in the country. He has been principal investigator for over 60 clinical trials and has research interests in macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and vein occlusion as well as surgical pathology. He is involved in clinical trials to develop new drugs, delivery devices, and gene therapy. Dr. Sheth, thanks so much for joining us today. Diana, thank you uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, pleasure to be here today. I know this is a really um, hot topic. We've already been getting lots of questions on this. So we'll go ahead and um, start the discussion off by actually defining geographic atrophy, or as we will likely call it um, and abbreviate it during the call, GA. Uh, for many people, it's a term they were not as familiar with until we started hearing a lot more about it over the past year or so as, um, as treatments have, becoming, have become available. Um, even the statistics say that more than a million people in the U.S. alone currently have GA. Um, could you start by um, sharing with us what is geographic atrophy and how does it differ from or how is it related to dry macular degeneration? Yeah, yeah great place to start. So, you know, you brought up the, the point that, you know, a million and probably more than a million Americans have this disease, but until recently, it wasn't something that we talked a lot about. And I think part of that is because we didn't have any treatments for it. And so a lot of times, you know, we would see patients that have this, this type of macular regeneration uh, and, and frustratingly, we weren't able to offer them anything. And so I think part of why we're starting to talk about it more, we're starting to hear about it, we're seeing commercials on television is because finally, uh, as of earlier this year, we have treatment options for patients. So, so let's talk a little bit about it. So geographic atrophy is a form of dry macular degeneration. And I think it's probably important to really kind of define what dry macular degeneration is. So what is the macula? The macula is the central part of the retina. What is the retina? The retina is the back layer of the eye. It's almost like the film in the camera. So the part of the eye that processes your vision. And so the macula being the central part of that is responsible for your central vision. And so any degeneration that happens in that area is going to cause a degeneration in your central vision. You know, that's the, that's the vision that we use to read or look at faces or, or watch television with, or, you know, when we're on our devices, that's the part of the retina that's processing that information. And so any degeneration in that area is going to affect all of those activities that we just talked about, the dry component. So why do we say dry macular versus wet macular? Well, well, for the longest time, for about 20 years, 
we've really focused in on wet macular. And when we say wet, we say wet because there's fluid leaking into the retina. That fluid could be blood. It could be uh, components of blood leaking into the retina causing vision loss. Why have we talked about that for 20 years? Because we've had great therapies, treatments for those types of macular degeneration cases. But dry means that there's a de degeneration that is not necessarily, uh, that doesn't have fluid involved. There's no bleeding. Um, and then look, let's talk about dry macula for a second. So dry comes in a lot of different flavors as well. There's more mild forms of it. There's intermediate, more advanced forms. And the most advanced form of dry macular degeneration is called geographic atrophy. So atrophy means thinning or loss of that retinal tissue. In other words, in that central part of your retina, you're actually starting to see a loss of that tissue. And when you lose nerve tissue, when you lose retina, it's not working, right? And so you get uh, central vision loss, blind spots in your vision, distortion in your vision, all of those things as a result of what we call geographic atrophy. Thank you for that really good description. I, I, I love hearing it described as, uh, you know, as the film in a camera and the visual that that gives us to really understand what's happening. So thank you for putting that into really understandable lay terms. Um, as far as progression goes, how quickly does intermediate dry AMD progress to advanced dry AMD or geographic atrophy? Um, and to follow up with that, if someone has received a diagnosis of dry macular degeneration or AMD, how often and when should they be following up with their doctor to discuss um, potential progression to GA or um, identification diagnosis of geographic atrophy? Okay, great questions. Um, so there's a couple parts. I'll answer your first part. So your question was really progression and how quickly does intermediate dry macular progress to the more advanced forms or, or in particular geographic atrophy. And, and I think it's an important point to just take a step back and say, look, it is a spectrum. You know, we do see macular start off as mild macular. You know, these are cases where we see a few little findings in the retina, uh, and at that point, you know, we're potentially informing our patients about it. And as it progresses, you see more, you know, more changes to that macula, which are more concerning because as it advances, it becomes more likely over time that it, it can progress to something like geographic atrophy or wet macular degeneration, right? So those are the two ends of the spectrum. So your question about how quickly does it change from intermediate dry AMD uh, to more advanced dry AMD. And there's, there's no real kind of cut and dry answer to that. There's a lot of variables here. So what are things that might cause the macular degeneration uh, in, a, in a patient's case progress more quickly? So genetics, right? We know that there's a big genetic component to macular degeneration. If you've got a strong family history of it, there's a chance that your macular degeneration may progress more quickly. So it's really important, uh, one, to know what the, that family history is and, and certainly relay that information to whoever's taking care of you uh, and doing your eye exams. Uh, things like environmental factors that, that sometimes we do have control over. I'll give you one, smoking. Smoking really causes an accelerated progression in your macular degeneration. And so if you've got two patients that present with the same disease, you, the, the person that's smoking is going to likely progress more quickly than the person that's not smoking. So that's an important driver in how quickly or, or how slow that, that disease can move. Um, things like diet, right? We, we kind of take these things for granted sometimes, but one of the reasons your, your doctor may recommend certain vitamins is because we know that certain antioxidants like vitamin E, zinc, copper, um, those things can slow down damage that's, that's occurring in the macula. And so Look, just a green, healthy vegetable every now and then can help slow things down. So we know that that diet affects that as well. Uh, and then age, right? The older you are, this is called AMD, age-related macular degeneration. So the older you are, uh, the more quickly it can progress. And so those are just kind of different variables that can kind of all factor in together to cause faster or slower progression in this disease. Uh, your second part of your question was, you know, if someone now is diagnosed with dry AMD, when should they follow up to their, their doctor, their eye care provider? And the answer to that is it depends, right? And it depends on a lot of those things we just talked about. You know, what is their risk? Do they have a strong family history? Are they a smoker? And how advanced is their disease? And so a lot of those kind of, a lot of that math is going to be done by the person taking care of your eyes. If they think you're at low risk and you've got fairly mild disease, they may say, 
come back in six months or a year. But if you've got more advanced disease and, and you certainly have more risk factors, then they may say, well, look, maybe come back in three months or come back in six months. So I think a lot of it depends on a lot of those factors we discussed, but it is absolutely um, something that you're going to want to discuss with your eye care provider. Thank you. Um, let's switch um, over to when they've already received a GA diagnosis. Um, does progression tend to happen um, at a faster pace once, you know, geographic atrophy has set in? Um, and we have uh, listeners asking how much does a GA diagnosis increase the probability or possibility of going blind? Um, let's start there, and then I have a couple other questions from the audience. Yeah, 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 great question. So. Um, you know, as I mentioned, geographic atrophy is one of the most advanced forms of macular degeneration. And so certainly because of that, the risk of losing vision, um, and, and the word blindness is a little tricky because patients will ask about this all the time, am I going to go blind? And, and with macular degeneration, if your only problem with the eyes is macular degeneration, you're not going to go blind in the sense that you wake up and all of a sudden the world is dark on you but it does affect the center most part of your vision, arguably the most important part of your vision, because again, that's where your fine focus comes from, but your peripheral vision is not affected by it. Um, and I say that because, you know, people can function perfectly well if they have geographic atrophy in one eye and the other eye is not experiencing that, they can have a full field of vision and good central vision. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, but, you know, if your question is, well, how quickly is it going to speed up once you get that diagnosis? I kind of default back to the answer to the last question, which is there's so many variables here, including genetics, including are you a smoker or not, including some of those environmental and age-related things that we talked about. And so there's no clear-cut way of answering that question. But what I will say is, um, you know, there are certain characteristics that your doctor is going to look at with that GA as a retina specialist. We're not just saying, do you have GA or not? When you have GA, we're really looking into, okay, what are the characteristics? Are there multiple spots of GA? How large is the GA? Where exactly is the GA in your retina? Because all of those variables for us can then help guide us to how quickly do we expect this GA to accelerate or change over time again, then allowing us to inform our patients about that. So again, you know, not to be coy or not to kind of avoid the question, but the answer is really, it depends. Um, but there's a lot of variables at play, including what your eye doctor is seeing in the eye and how they're defining it. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, go to a couple audience questions. One is related to the environmental factors we were discussing. Um, and the question is specifically, does screen time or, you know, focus time on computers and or phones, you know, or other screens, um, does that um, contribute at all to progression? Yeah, it's it's such a timely question, right? Because I think, you know, what we learned, especially as retina specialists, what we learned during the pandemic is a lot of people are on their screens a lot more, right? Whether it's because you're working from home, whether it's because we've just seen an explosion in these devices that we have around us, whether it's tablets or phones or whatever it is, and we're on them all the time now. And so we're constantly asking the question of, hey, is that is that hurting us in a way that this is going to cause impact things like macular degeneration or things like nearsightedness? And the answer is we think so, but it's such a new thing for us, right? We haven't had these devices for 50, 60 years. Really, it's been five to 10 years where we've seen the, the increased use of these devices. And so because of that, because mac things like macular degeneration are a slow-moving kind of disease, there's something that you don't see in 30 and 40-year-olds. You tend to see them in 60, 70, 80-year-olds. We, we don't have great answers to that yet. I think we will at some point, especially once we've had more time with these devices and as people that have been using the devices at earlier ages get a little older and we see the impact on that, we'll have better answers. But, but what I would tell you is what I tell my patients, which is, look, everything in moderation, right? I think anything where you're going overboard or doing just excess amounts of things like this, where you're on the screen for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, which you know, we see pretty commonly for people that are, that are on the computer for work and things like that. 
Um, I tell people, look, you got to take breaks. You got to give your eyes a rest. Um, I think, you know, the question of wearing, you know, glasses that help kind of filter out blue light, uh, putting on screen guards that help filter out some of the light. I think these are all good ideas, just common sense ideas. We don't have the best evidence yet. I think one day we will. But I think these are kind of common sense things that we can do. One, not just to re reduce eye strain, but eventually to re reduce some of these harmful effects of, of, of these screens that are in front of us. I like that practical advice. I know, you know, for me, being on the computer all day and then back and forth on my phone, I, I, I definitely feel like my vision is blurrier and my eyes are tired by the end of the day. So, you know, that's something I can observe, but I imagine there are other processes that, that are likely going on beyond that. Um, yeah, and, and okay, listen, so next, to that point, we're, we're, I was going to say we're also getting introduced to these screens much earlier, right? I mean, you talk about your son. Well, you know, kids are on these devices quite a bit now, and we still are just learning about the impact. So, so I think, again, just that's just blanket advice about, about moderation. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, we've got another question from Ralph, um, who um, is asking about home monitoring. What changes in particular um, that one notices as they do the Amsler grid should they immediately call their retina specialist about? Um, and are there other signs that people should be at, looking for at home, um, you know, kind of looking out for that there, as a signal that their vision might be worsening? Yeah, a great question. So home monitoring is, is real important. We talked to all of our macular degeneration patients about this. So you, you talked about the Amsler grid. So hopefully, you know, everyone on the call knows what that is. And if not, you know, it's a little grid uh, that has a series of, of boxes and lines. And, and the key is you test each eye independently. So cover one eye and take a look kind of at reading distance at that grid. And, you know, all the, if you have no macular degeneration, all those lines theoretically should be straight. Now, if you have some degree of macular regeneration, even just kind of intermediate dry macular regeneration, you may have a little bit of distortion. So some of those lines may not be straight, they may be a little wavy. And if that's your normal baseline, that's your normal baseline because you know some, some degree of that is expected if you've got some degree of macular regeneration. Now, the key is, and, and your question is, when do you notify your, your, your doctor is when you start to notice changes from your baseline. So if you start to say, look, the lines are looking wavier to me, that's, that's a good reason to call your, your doctor. If you say, look, I'm starting to see real blurred in that, in that uh, Amsler grid, uh, that's a reason. Or, hey, I'm seeing a dark spot in that grid. Um, any of those things are kind of triggers for you to say, look, I'm gonna call my doctor. And your doctor is going to listen to you. They're going to say, look, well, that, you know, I expect that because of what you have, or, hey, that sounds different. Why don't you come on in and let's take a look. So, so I think it's, it's worth making the phone call and then letting them kind of decide what the right next step is for them. Great. Um, another quick question from a listener. Does having GA in one eye increase the likelihood that the AMD in the other, that, that they'll have GA in the other eye, whether or not they already have um, dry AMD in that eye? Yeah, I, it's a great question. What, one thing that I can tell people is that the general thing is if something's happened in one eye, it's more likely to happen in the other eye. That, that goes for macular regeneration, that goes for cataracts, it goes for really any problem. And it's no different for GA. So GA, yes, if you've got it in one eye, you are at a higher risk of developing it in the other eye. Uh, and that, again, goes for dry AMD, wet AMD, GA, all of it. And so I think it's important because your doctor is going to know that and they're going to be looking for that every time. People that that are listening that, that go to see their doctors for GA or wet macular regeneration know that, generally speaking, their, their specialists are really not only looking at the eye they're treating, but also looking at the other eye specifically for this reason. Absolutely. I know a lot of times in the chats, you know, people like yourself will say, you know, not only is every person different, but every eye is different and <laughs> really are, are treated as two different um, potential. You know, we've got plenty of people on the call today with both wet AMD in one eye and dry AMD in the other. Um, so that's, that's Absolutely. good to know. Um, we'll ask one last quick question um, about dry AMD. And then we'll shift over to the treatments um, that have become available this year. Um, so the, the question is, there are many people who um, are currently on ARIDS 2 vitamins because they have been identified as having dry AMD. Um, listeners are asking, are ARIDS effective at all once um, the dry AMD has progressed to geographic atrophy? Yeah, it's an important kind of uh, topic because um, it is one of the things that we've, we've told people about, told patients about for, for decades. And so really, what is the purpose of AREDS vitamins? The purpose of AREDS vitamins, and, and now we're, we're talking about AREDS 2 formulation of these vitamins, 
is to reduce the likelihood of that dry macular degeneration progressing to the wet macular degeneration. So whether they have GA or intermediate dry macular degeneration, I recommend these vitamins to my patients because I do think it lowers the risk of them developing the wet type of macular degeneration. And so I think it's important and I think it's a great question to ask. And certainly, you know, it's a good question for patients to ask their eye care providers about because you know, at some stages of macular, we may not even recommend the vitamins. And so I think it's a really important thing to discuss with your provider. Absolutely. And then, of course, going back to the different scenarios that might be occurring in, in one eye or the other. Uh, so it could be helpful for one, I suppose. Okay. Um, let's kind of shift over to um, the exciting news of the year. Um, it's been a really <laughs> busy year in ophthalmology, but especially related to um, the first ever treatments for geographic atrophy. Um, in February and then in August, we saw the first two drugs approved um, for treating geographic atrophy. Um, could you give us an overview of the treatments that are now available? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, in the in the intro, I know you mentioned that we do a lot of clinical trial work. So, so we've been doing clinical trial work in geographic atrophy for, for many, many years. And so we've had this kind of pent up excitement about potentially being able to treat patients that have geographic atrophy for many years. And that all kind of kind of exploded this this earlier this year, like you said, when we had our first treatment approved, uh, which was called Cyphovri. Um, and then subsequently, you know, about a month ago, uh, a second treatment called Isurvay. And so, you know, this has really changed everything uh, in our field, right? This, this reminds me of 20 years ago when we had our first treatments for wet macular degeneration approved, where before that, we had no real, no real good way of stabilizing people's vision. Um, and and, and that, at that time, 20 years ago, was a game changer. So I, I feel that happening again in our field. And, it, and it's incredibly encouraging because we have now, for the first time, like you said, uh, something to offer patients. And so what does that mean? So what, is, what, is the, 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 what are these treatments really aimed at doing, right? So we talked about, before this, we talked about geographic atrophy and how the atrophy or the thinning in the retina can gradually spread over time. And what that means is the vision loss associated with those areas that are, that are becoming atrophic or thin starts to expand. In other words, if you've got a blind spot from atrophy, the blind spot gets bigger over time. Well, these drugs, what they do is they don't reverse the blind spot. In other words, they don't kind of put retinal tissue back in, but what they do is they slow down the further damage that's going to happen in that eye. In other words, if you're on a trajectory of that atrophy getting worse and worse and worse over time, this, these drugs are going to slow down that trajectory. They won't stop it, so they won't kind of halt it in its tracks. But if you think about atrophy like a runaway train, this can really help slow that train down. And so, so we're excited because what we, what we know that means for our patients is that if I have a patient that's starting to lose vision from atrophy and I start them on one of these treatments, I know that a year later or two years later or three years later that these patients are going to be better off because I took them off that that runaway train and I put them on a slower train. So that vision loss, we really started to slow it down in a meaningful way, right? You know, we talk to patients all the time that are kind of on the verge of, of, of losing some of that central vision. And let's say they're 20, 40 today, but I know that that, that macular degeneration is gonna get worse and within a year or two, they may be 20, 60 or 20, 70. We're talking about the difference between being able to drive and, and run your own errands to now potentially losing your license. And so the, if we can slow that process down and delay that as much as possible, that, that to me is going to have a meaningful impact on that patient's life. That's, I, I love the way how you articulated that. And I know it's been, um, you know, a, a, a bit of a decision for folks, you know, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but weighing side effects with, you know, kind of doing something that you know is good for you, but you're not seeing necessarily the immediate benefit. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to talk about that in a moment. Um, could you, I, I know both of these drugs um, target different um, areas or components of the complement pathway. Um, could you kind of go over how they work in the eye and then how, um, you know, the, the differences between the two in terms of approach? Um, and then I guess touch on whether, you know, contrast and compare, are the treatment regimens the same, 
um, you know, in particular, it's the same interval in between injections. Um, so both how the drug works and then how um, the two treatments kind of differ and um, are the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, good, good question. So, so you mentioned complement at the very beginning of that question, and I think it's important to kind of talk about what that is just briefly. So complement is a, is a process in our, in our bodies, everywhere in our bodies, but, but in particular in the eye, responsible for potentially something like inflammation. And, and we know historically that, that the complement factor or this kind of hyperactivity of this complement um, in the eye may be associated with worsening geographic atrophy. We know that from, um, from gene, therapy, gene studies and, and things like that in the past. And, and for longer than a decade, we've known that this is, there's an association there. And so the thought was, okay, well, if we can slow that complement activity down in the eye, in other words, to kind of tune that, that inflammatory pathway down a bit, can we then slow down the damage being done in the eye? And so that was kind of the theory behind why we are targeting that approach for this type of disease. And so what we've seen with these two treatments is they both indeed really looked at kind of slowing down that process. They do, they do see this in, in slightly different ways. Um, but what we've seen is by doing that, We've seen clinically, we've been able to slow the disease down. And so, so it's important to understand, okay, well, what are we doing? Essentially, what we're doing is kind of turning the infl inflammation down in those deeper layers of the retina, which are responsible for, for the geographic atrophy progression. And so if we turn those down, we can slow down the damage being done. Okay, so then your next part of the question was, okay, how are these similar? So I kind of, you know... That's how they're, that's how they're similar. The other similar approaches they're they're both given in the same way. They're both intravitreal injections. So we have to numb the eye up and then give the injection so that the medicine goes directly into the eye. Uh, and that's a you know for for people on the call they probably are aware of these types of treatments. We've been doing this for wet macular degeneration for 20 years for things like diabetic retinopathy and retinal vein occlusions for a long long time. And so the the, the type of procedure is, is not new by any means. It's just the treatment itself is new, both of these treatments. Um, and then how, how often are they given? Uh, they're both approved to be given monthly. The Sifovri can be given every month to every two months. So you can go every other month with the treatment and still have a, have a good efficacious effect. Uh, the Isurve, we, we right now currently have it approved for every month treatment. And by giving these treatments, you can really see a meaningful slowdown in the disease. Um, and then they can be given for, for quite a long period of time uh, in order to kind of continue that slowdown of the disease. Um, I think I answered most. Was there another part of the question there? I might have missed it. No, I think you've got it. Thank you. Um, we have a question yeah. from the audience. We had the opportunity um, to talk a little bit more in depth about Sifovri, um, you know, after the February approval. We've got a listener um, asking, you know, for the the kind of the most recent data, um, or as they said, statistics for Isurve in terms of, you know, a percentage of slowing down progression. Can you talk a little bit about what that data looks like? Yeah, so there were a couple, for the Isurve in particular, there was a couple of studies done. They were called the Gather 1 and Gather 2 studies. Um, and these were the studies that helped get the FDA approval. And so what they demonstrated in those studies is somewhere between a 17 and 34% reduction uh, in the, the, the growth of these geographic atrophy lesions. Um, and so we're talking, you know, somewhere between 17 and 34% slowdown of these, of these lesions. And so I tell people that because, you know, if... And, I, and I, I not only tell them that, I show them the pictures of their atrophy when they're in my clinic, because I think when you see this and when you see this on the screen in front of you, you can, you can really appreciate, well, yeah, if I slow this down and I can prevent this from, from really kind of growing in the central retina, we can have a meaningful effect on vision. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I, I think... Um... I'm, I'm scanning through a couple of different questions we have here. Um, I'll go with the next one being, how do doctors evaluate which to use in patients? Um, and is it possible, we have a lot of people wondering, if they've started with one, are they able to then move to the other? You know, I know with wet AMD in particular, um, doctors tend to, you know, try one, and if they're not pleased with the results, they switch. Um, is that the case for, um, for these two drugs as well? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, and... You know, so the first part was, how do you pick between these two treatments? And what I'll tell you, uh, Diana, is that these are both really new treatments, right? And and what we are, when when we have two new treatments like this, 
we're really kind of using them both and, and getting a feel for, for kind of what's happening in the real world because both uh, have really good clinical trial data, meaningful and, and, and good slowdown in those clinical trials. What we want to see now is kind of that next phase of adoption is, okay, let's get it in our hands, let's use it, let's see how patients do with it. And we're just in the early innings of that, right? We just had one approved in February and one last month. And so if we have this conversation a year or two from now, the answer might be different, but but we're so early in the process that I think there's no real kind of, at least in my personal practice, we're we're using both treatments, okay? So then the next part was, um, you know, can you switch? And, And that's a tougher question to answer because neither of these clinical trials looked at that, right? So we don't have any clinical trial data that had a patient on one of these treatments that then switched to another treatment. So there's no real great way of me answering that question. Do I think that in the real world, we will be doing that where we'll have a patient on one and for whatever reason, we may switch them to another treatment? Absolutely. I think it happens all the time in wet macular degeneration. So I do foresee that happening as well with geographic atrophy treatments. And so again, once we have more time with these therapies in the real world, I think the answer is, yep, we're going to do that. And, and I, my instinct is that you can do that without really too much concern. Yeah, really good point about how new these treatments are. Um, you know, I feel like we've been waiting for these for a long time and, and looking forward to, to seeing how it works in the real world. But absolutely, um, you know, I realize we're not even a year in <laughs> on, on either at this point. So we'll, we'll make sure to continue to follow up on that as time goes on and, you know, revisit that discussion um, next year. Um, before I get into side effects and balancing those, um, which is, you know, we have a lot of questions about that. Um, are these treatments advised or um, available for those who already have wet AMD, or what does that treatment plan look like? Yeah, um, a really good question. And again, uh, you know, one of the things that I can tell you is that we didn't really study in a broad way patients that had wet macular that now we're starting on treatment for geographic atrophy. But what I will tell you is in our clinical practice, since these drugs have been approved, we are indeed treating patients that way. So in other words, if I have a patient that I'm treating for wet macular degeneration and they have geographic atrophy, I have started some of those patients on the treatment for the geographic atrophy, in particular because I think that that is driving some of their their vision loss or that could be or soon to be driving some of their vision loss. I want to get ahead of that atrophy in those cases. And so we are seeing that, but again, not broadly studied in these clinical trials, so can't give you real good data on it yet. I think I answered that question. Any other questions on that? Um, related to that, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to kind of shift over uh, into balancing, you know, kind of the conversation about potential side effects and balancing those mm-hmm. with the benefit um, of delaying the progression. And so on that same topic of what AMD, um, I do have folks who are wondering what percentage, you know, or, or what's the risk um, of developing wet AMD after um, having an injection of either Cyphovir or Isorve. Yeah, it's it's a it's an important question, and it's something that I talk to all my patients about because you, just risks with any treatment in general are really important to discuss with your provider. And so the way I break it down, there's kind of two buckets of risks. One one bucket is just the risk of an injection procedure, right? So that that could be any any medication you're injecting are going to have a common set of risks. You know, the, the most kind of important for me is, is infection, right? Anytime you're putting something from outside of the eye into the eye, there's a risk that there's a contamination or something like that. Now, thankfully, I think the risk is very low, and we do certain things from a technique standpoint to keep that risk as low as possible, but absolutely something to, to talk about and something that I, I tell my patients about all the time. Then, then there's the risk of the actual drug itself. That's the second bucket. And, and what we've seen with both of these treatments is that there's potentially a slightly higher risk of developing the wet macular degeneration in the eye that you're treating for geographic atrophy. In other words, an eye that just has geographic atrophy, no wet macular degeneration, if you start treating with Cyphovri or Isorve, there's a chance, slightly ch- higher chance, that, um, that you develop the wet macular regeneration uh, in that eye. And, and it's a very important topic, again, to discuss because um, it, it's something that I talk to my patients about. It's something that has certainly um, made some patients think twice about treatment. 
um, because they don't necessarily want to then start having treatment then for wet macular degeneration. But some patients, especially patients where their geographic atrophy is really starting to, to risk central vision loss and really approaching the central part of their vision, um, they will say, well, I know you have, doc, I know you have a treatment for wet macular regeneration. I know the risk, you know, is there, but I'm willing to take that on because if I can maintain this level of vision, I'm going to do everything I can to do that. And so, so it's really about talking through these risks with the patient um, and then really a, as a group kind of deciding what's right for that individual. Sure thing. Um, I'm going to clarify. We have we have someone asking um, whether the treatments repair lost vision, and I just wanted to clarify that th these are really designed to slow down progression, and they're not going to cause people to regain their vision that's already been lost. Um, and I really like what you said earlier about showing you know showing your patients the pictures to be able to see you know that the progression and what it might mean, um, and really the 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 example you gave of driving or not driving, you know, and, and losing independence, um, obviously I think are important things um, as part of this conversation. We have two other side effect um, questions that I'll just kind of do quickly. Um, does GA itself or GA treatment increase the risk of retinal detachment? Um, and the second one is, does GA or GA treatment increase um, the risk of a failed interocular lens following cataract surgery? Um, they're both a little okay. bit different, but these are of the interest to the audience. Okay, good. So just quick blanket comment, the GA itself does not increase any of those risks. So the, the geographic atrophy or having a diagnosis of geographic atrophy does not increase your risk of a retinal detachment or any lens cataract issue. The injection procedure, again, independent of what disease you have, it could be GA, it could be wet macular, it could be diabetic retinopathy, but the injection procedure itself does carry a slight risk of having a detached retina. We talked about the uh, infection risk. Um, the cataract risk is, is very minimal. Um, you know, are there cases where it affects the lens in the eye? It can, but very rare. And so um, it's, it's one of those things, again, these are things that we do counsel our patients on, um, especially things like retinal detachment. But again, risk is very low and not necessarily associated with the fact that it's GA or a treatment for GA, but really because of the procedure itself, because of how we're giving the treatments. Sure thing. That makes perfect sense. Um, as we start to wrap up, um, you know, I know that I've had many discussions with folks, you know, weighing the potential benefit, um, you know, with how much, pro you know, how much progression they think they might halt versus side effects. What questions, you know, are there two or three questions um, that you would suggest that would kind of guide um, the conversation with our listeners as they, you know, are talking with their doctor throughout this decision making process? Yeah, you know, and and I uh, yes, I think there's always good questions you can ask your your doctor, and and I'm I'm really basing these off of what my patients ask me and what I what I consider really good questions for them to ask because uh, the information they get is is meaningful. It, it kind of it can help them decide you know how they're going to follow up or the importance of follow up or or how they're going to counsel their family members and instruct them to maybe get their eye exams right so i think all of those things are important and so you know how do you ask that question you know you you start with do i have macular degeneration right i think if you're going to an eye doctor and i think a lot of people start at primary eye care whether it's your optometrist or ophthalmologist not necessarily a retina specialist so i think it's important to ask those eye care providers you know Basic questions, do I have macular regeneration? Do I have cataracts? Do I have glaucoma? Those are the three that I think are probably the most important to ask about. Uh, and if the answer is no, great. You know, then it's about well, how often do I follow up? But if the answer is yes, then it's, okay, doctor, what can I do to lower my risk? It may be taking vitamins. It may be wearing sunglasses while I'm out and about. It may be, you know, so there's a whole host of things that again are gonna be tailored to that individual and really important to have as a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And then that last thing I kind of mentioned is, you know, do I need to worry about my family members? Do I need to counsel my family members? One of the things that comes up uh, a bit in my office is, you know, I have a patient in for macular degeneration and, I, and they ask about their family and I ask just some basic questions, like especially about smoking, right? And that's one of those things where we can tell them, hey, you know, just if, if they haven't been told, you know, let, let's, let's see if they can, they, can, they can cut down the cigarette smoking because we know that's a huge driver in progression, especially if you've got a family history. So, so things like that are important to discuss with, with your, your eye care provider. 
Outstanding. <laughs> this is a kind of, um, you know, I could have asked this earlier. We just got a question about secondhand smoke. Um, you know, we, we understand that um, smoking cessation and, you know, trying to quit smoking if you are a smoker um, definitely reduces that risk. Um, what about secondhand smoke? Is that something that people should be worried about or has that been studied? Yeah, there's not a lot of great data on it, but I, but I think there's enough data to suggest that, yes, I think it does matter, um, especially, you know, if you're in a house where, where people are smoking quite a bit. I think it does matter. I think, fortunately, you know, just when we're out and about, we're, we're exposed to a lot less secondhand smoke. We don't see it as much, at least in the U.S. and at restaurants or, or when we're just kind of at events. And so that's been good. I think that's had a, had a good effect, a positive effect on, on people, people's health and their eyes in particular. Uh, but, yes, I think if you're in a home where there's, there's people smoking, I think it does increase your risk theoretically. Okay, that's great to know. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, we're running out of time. Um, I sincerely hope that everybody found today's chat helpful. Um, and we know that participation in research studies is what advances uh, the field in terms of treatments. And, and this has been a great example of that today. I just want to say this is an ongoing topic, um, you know, and we're, we're thrilled to be able to talk about um, the fact that there are now treatments for geographic atrophy. And to your point, I think, you know, the real world experience will be ongoing. So we'll, we'll, we'll bring you back at some point to kind of give an update after um, some time under our belts. So, Dr. Chef, before we conclude, are there any final remarks or tips um, or overarching message that you'd like to share with the audience today before we conclude? Uh, I think the last kind of bit is just if if it hasn't come through yet uh, in my statements, I think this is an incredibly exciting time for us um, as eye care providers because we're finally able to to treat this huge unmet need, uh, and we're we're really excited about it. And so so hopefully this kind of sparks a conversation, uh, not just amongst this group, but but amongst your 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 friends and families, and 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 certainly with with your eye care providers. And so again, I appreciate the the time here and and the uh, the ability to kind of discuss this with, with everybody on the call. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. We know how busy you are, um, both with trials and, and seeing your patients as well. So um, we really want to give you a warm thank you for, for taking the time today to discuss this with us. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll give you a, a call back in a, you know, after some time has passed and we can kind of revisit the topic and see where we are. Um, so thank you again. And thanks to the audience for tuning in. And with that, this concludes the Bright Focus Macular Chat. Thanks so much for joining today. The information provided in this recording is a public service of Bright Focus Foundation and is not intended to constitute medical advice. Please consult your physician for personalized medical, dietary, and or exercise advice. Any medications or supplements should only be taken under medical supervision. Bright Focus Foundation does not endorse any medical products or therapies.